So electrolyte imbalances are something that you're going to learn about in definitely one or two or three or even more of your courses. So this is actually a really important piece of you know nursing knowledge and content knowledge as well. Now, one of the things that most students get confused about the most is that there's so many electrolytes. How am I going to remember every single sign and symptom when it's too high or it's too low and some things are the same and what am I supposed to do? But as just a starting point, as a basic starting point, I'm going to use these four electrolytes um, that are really kind of the popular guys or girls, however you want to see it, um, that we talk about in, in nursing as far as nursing education is concerned. So sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Now, a lot of these imbalances, whether they're high or low, they do overlap. So for instance, someone who might have hyponatremia, low sodium, they might have symptoms that you can see in another electrolyte imbalance. Maybe you see the same type of things in someone who's got hypocalcemia or hypomagnesemia. So those things do overlap. A big piece of advice that I would suggest for you is to make sure that you know the things that stick out. So what is specific to that electrolyte that you don't see in other things? Or what is specific in that electrolyte imbalance that is really, really significant, that can do a lot of harm to the patient? So most often you're not gonna be asked in an NCLEX scenario or even a testing scenario in class to name off all the electrolyte imbalances. I mean, maybe your instructor does that, but most often you're not going to see that. What you are going to be faced with is a scenario, think about a question or a case study where the patient uh, is taking, let's say, a potassium supplement or they're receiving potassium IV. And question wants you to recognize what imbalance might be present. So they might say that this person is receiving potassium supplements and they're complaining about leg cramps. So the idea is to get you to understand that, okay, well, this potassium is playing a role in this person's manifestations. Is it because there's too much or is it because there's too little? So it's recognizing one, there's a problem, and two, what the problem likely is. Is it hyper or hypo? And then, of course, understanding the treatment for it. So we're going to talk about some of the imbalances and we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms that we would expect to see in these imbalances that are pretty specific to these electrolytes. We're going to try not to overlap too much. So sodium, the big thing to know for sodium, and I'm going to make a little note here, is that when we have sodium imbalances, our central nervous system can be affected. And that's a worst case scenario, meaning that some of the The uh, more severe things that can happen with sodium imbalances are seizures and a decreased LOC. And that's a really bad thing compared to something like feeling tired or having abdominal cramping, right? So I'm gonna put the big deal kind of right here. So when we have hypo, hypo meaning low, hyponatremia, natremia for sodium, some of the common things that we can see, confusion is one. Again, that kind of fits the bill for our CNS conversation. Feeling tired. This person might have abdominal cramping. If your sodium's low, it's likely that you're going to crave some salt. And so that's kind of a little trigger to look out for. And then worst case scenario, I'll put a little asterisk here, a little star. When things get really bad, right, our sodium level is really critically low, we're at risk for seizures. And so this is why when you have somebody who has hyponatremic, one of the things that we should do as far as nursing interventions and other healthcare interventions really is that we put this person on seizure precautions because we know that there's a risk for this happening. Now, on the other side, when we talk about hyper, Sometimes it's going to be a direct opposite of what we see in hypo, and sometimes not. Sometimes it's going to be a new symptom that we didn't see before. So we talk about an opposite here. In hypo, we craved salt, right? Well, in hyper, we might see that this person is craving water. Um, Other things that we'll notice is some weakness, and I kind of think about this as an opposite as well because we had cramping in the abdomen. Now we're feeling some overall weakness. And then of course, the big deal, because we talked about CNS being the, the uh, you know big effect that can be impacted here, would be convulsions, decreased LOC, and so I'll put seizure abbreviation here as well. 
Now for potassium, our potassium is low, we have hypokalemia, we might see that we have some cardiac arrhythmia. Someone make a little broken heart here, right? One of the things that we see is a presence of a U wave that's not normally present on an ECG. And in most cases, we don't see that. Leg cramping is another thing. So let's put leg cramps. And this is a, a pretty common kind of hallmark sign. That's why I use it in, in a question. We have decreased GI motility. So I'll put a decreased GI there. Now, with decreased GI motility, think about the things that would come along with that. So decreased bowel sounds, for instance, would be another thing that we would see as a result of that decreased GI motility. So decreased bowel sounds. I put that there. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and add that we are going to have some decreased deep tendon reflexes. Now, if we come here to hyper, right, cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrest, something that can happen here with, that's a heart and a bad face. Cardiac arrest is something that can happen here. So I'm going to come over here to our potassium colon and I'm going to put a heart because just like CNS was a big deal with sodium, cardiac is a big deal with potassium. So this person's at risk for cardiac arrest, muscle weakness. So I'm going to put weakness here. And remember, look on our other side where we have hypo, we have the cramps. So it does kind of seem like an opposite. The weakness is what we're going to experience here. Instead of GI motility being decreased like it was in hypo, we're going to have GI hyperactivity. So I'll make this uh, arrow up showing hyperactivity um, of our GI system. So we see that there's some contrast here. And that makes it a little bit easier to remember it. Calcium, big deal for calcium is... Neuro, and that doesn't necessarily just mean brain. Remember, thinking about nerves as well. So neuro would be the big deal with calcium. So in low calcium, hypocalcemia, some of the signs and symptoms, of course, weak bones. We think about our bones when we talk about calcium, our teeth. Our teeth might be in bad shape because of that. So let's add bad teeth. Severe muscle cramping. So let's put severe cramping for our muscles. And then something that you probably hear a lot because we see this come up so often in testing scenarios are our trousseaus and chavsek signs. So our trousseau, let's see if I can fit that here. Okay, I'll put trousseau and our chavsek signs. That goes with hypocalcemia. Now, of course, these severe muscle crampings can lead to muscle tremors that can uh, progress to convulsions, dysrhythmias, hyperactive DTRs, and that's our, let's put that there. And that would go with our neuro as well as our convulsions. Okay, so those are worst case kind of things that can happen. I'll even add our seizures there for convulsions. Now, hyper, we're going to see lethargy, bone pain, so where we had that weak bones in the hypo, now we're having bone pain here. Instead of increased DTRs, we've got decreased DTRs with hypercalcemia. Now, if we come down here to magnesium, neuro. Neuro is also another thing as far as our worst case scenario that can happen with magnesium problems. And of course, when I say worst case scenario, I'm thinking about the body system, you know, the body system that we really don't want to be affected greatly because it would have the, the worst possible outcome for the patient. Well, in this case of, of all these, these electrolyte imbalances, if you have a problem with neuro changes, cardiac changes, those things can lead to death, right? So that's definitely the worst case scenario. So don't get confused when I'm saying worst case scenarios. This is the worst thing that could happen to you. Of course, fatality would be the worst thing that could happen to you. So with our magnesium, hypomagnesemia, low magnesium, things we can see, um, neuromuscular irritability, right? So we might see some tremors and increased reflexes and tachycardia. So let's make a tachy and a heart fast heart rate, right? Confusion. So we see that some of the big boys here, that's going to be our neuro um, problems, of course, and tachycardia, that's a little bit of cardiac that we have. 
Now, if we come over here and we talk about what happens when things are high, hypermagnesemia, we can see vasodilation. Nausea, vomiting, we might have some muscle weakness, N and V, it's gonna be our nausea, vomiting. Because we have this vasodilation, we can end up being hypotensive. I kind of wrote that in cursive, so hypotensive. And instead of increased DTRs, we're gonna have decreased DTRs. Um, we have tachycardia here in our hypo, we can actually experience cardiac arrest in hyper. So the big thing is to recognize these contrasts between the electrolyte imbalances. One, know the system that if it's affected would be the priority system, meaning that it could lead to the worst possible case for the patient. So that was our CNS being affected, our uh, neuro system being affected, our cardiac system being affected. Some of these symptoms that you see are gonna be opposites, uh, whether it's hypo or hyper, so recognize that and try to focus on the things that set these electrolyte balances apart from each other. So recognizing that trousseau's and Chopsek signs is something that is specific to hypocalcemia, as an example, and you don't see that in other things. Whereas muscle weakness is something that you might see in several different electrolyte imbalances, like with sodium and potassium. But what would set those things apart so we don't mix them up? So really focusing on the differences there.